Chapter 20 The room exhaled light and smoke, and he shut the door behind him, sat down across from her on one of two tired leather couches face to face. Glass mirrors, razor blades, screens, lighters, and rolled up bills were strewn across the table. There were other guys and girls beside her and Tony in the room. Some wore silk shirts, others in overcoats, most with long, dark hair. Drug-induced intimacy seemed to have killed any need for introductions. Tony tossed Will a carta blanca, and he grabbed a lighter from the table to jimmy the cap off. He looked away from the paraphernalia on the table, tilted the bottle up, took a long draw and stared across at her, to the stress on her face that described her affair with harder, inexpensive, costly crap. How you doing over there, baby? He asked Cass. Okay, escaped her breath. She asked her cigarette, met his eyes briefly, beyond replies. The bass from the club reverberated through the walls and ceiling above them jingling the strands of linked crystals of the chandelier picked out in the thirties by a tool and die foreman's tryst who knew only one thing on those nights she lay waiting for the factory to die down under a thin wool blanket on a cold blue striped mattress in that hidden room she stepped down to in heels her dress in her delicate hands the bare room needed a woman's touch Will looked around finally at the other folks in the room and froze. I think I'm going to get out of here, he said, fumbling in his pockets for the matchbook. God, he wished for his knife, the titanium grip, the snap of the wrist, the crisp locking of the blade. For the nerves. Or that sweet woman he talked to with the green hair just upstairs in this fucking cave. For the nerves. Don't go, Cass said, defenselessness in her voice. A girl on the other end of the couch has leaned forward in laughter, slapped her thighs and hugged the guy next to her violently. Beer spilled and she waited, waited for him to come around under the living light shining through touching crystals of the old chandelier under the thin cover of her amphetamine blanket, many times removed from him and that ultimate tension he had brought her to, her hands pinned above her head on the pillow, clasped in his, that preceded the ultimate relaxation, the kind that could survive a three-story fall down an elevator shaft. She was wearing jeans patched at the ass and knee with a handkerchief once tied to the guy's head, soaked in his sweat and often pushed off an edge of that same mattress. Will tried to think himself into a safe place where wax cooked in a tin on a stove, and a woman undressed, shy before him, and made an artist of him by sharing what some god gave her. But it was impossible. There she was before him, all right, but not exactly shy, laughing and wasted, in flesh and blood, the one, the only, and possibly Bella, there in the cave right before his eyes. I gotta leave, he said again, loud. His voice caught Bella's attention, and she saw him. Well, fine then, don't bother calling me, Cass shouted on his way out. I won't be home. He was halfway out the door and froze. Who, Cass whispered, looking at Bella, then back at Will. Her face turned red. She looked like she felt his pain, but hers was an all-too-differentiated form of suffering now, and the blood in her face was less shame, more the primitive kind of feeling we call anger, step up a notch to resentment, stepped up a notch to malice. Never mind her, Cass, please. She got her own thing going on, he said. I gotta go. 